60 seconds. All right. And I think we are live. Hi, Jeremy. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. How about you? I am doing great as well. I'm really happy to see all the talks that we're having. And I'm, I was yeah. particularly excited when I got your uh, proposal for this talk because mentoring, as I was telling you during the check-in process, is a subject dear to my heart. So I'm really excited, not only for the talk that you've just done, but also for the question that people are going to ask you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to answering some questions. Um, mentoring is also something near and dear. Um, something I did not mention is when folks would ask me, like, what was your most important class? Or I said, oh, easy, 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 high school English. <laughs> like, it's my whatever your primary written and spoken language is, I think is the most useful skill as a programmer. So. Right. Um, <laughs> so, as usual, people, if you want to ask questions to Jeremy, feel uh, Jeremy, sorry, feel free to find the link to the other pad either on the talk page on IR, on or on IRC. Uh, we're also going to open the chat so that people can join us and ask questions. Let me just make sure that I tell Sasha. Can you open ID uh, Mentor? All right. So, so in the meantime, what we'll do is that I'll be reading question of the pad, and Jeremy <laughs> will be answering them whilst we wait for you to join. Now, just to be clear with the time, uh, we have a little bit of time now, a little more time than before. Uh, we have 22 minutes, so until 10 of the next hours to answer as okay. many questions as possible. And believe me, if you people watching right now are not asking questions, I will be asking plenty of them. So please, uh, Great. save Jeremy from my inquisitive mind. Oh, I, I look forward to it. So, All right. Uh, starting with the first question, uh, a very trivial one, perhaps, but always one that I ask myself when I look at a keyboard. Uh, mm -hmm. Regarding the super key, which key do you bind to super? Yeah. Um, so my left command, which is on, my, on a Mac keyboard, so the key right to the left of the space bar is super. And the key immediately to the right of spacebar, which is the right command key, is bound to hyper, which opens up a whole new suite of keys. And I thought it would take a little bit to get used to, but it's been amazing. So I definitely recommend having a hyper binding. Uh, I will. Yes, uh, I was also going to say super binding. No, it's a hyper binding. We already have super. It's your Windows key or your Linux key or whatever you want to call it. Yep. Uh, but I will warn people, though, uh, it's the it's the gateway, uh, whatever, into <laughs> fancy keyboard setups because it starts. It's the Trojan horse of yep. fancy keyboard setup. Just oh, I wish I could have another modifier, and then uh, many years later, you find yourself with this little thing that I'm showing, which is a fully customized QMK keyboard. All right. Oh, yeah. Well, keep uh, this Following on that, then meta is to the left of super, and then control is to the left of meta. And also caps lock maps to control as well. Um, definitely tried a bunch of like tap for this and that on a, a, a programmable keyboard, but I have settled on keep it simple and use something like carabiner elements to do most of the mapping. Right. It's good that you were able to stop there. I wish I'd stopped there at some point <laughs> in my life. It was a terrible moment where I'm like, oh, what have I done when I was trying to type once? So yeah, it's it's great. All right. Um, well, moving on to the next question. Great talk. What's the package you use to make the org slide? Yeah, so I am using um, Prot's uh, is that Logos. And have i think like olivet mode um i'll post a link to the configuration for turning it on and off but it's basically narrow narrow region to an org heading um, which is i find that to be super helpful don't have to fiddle with it <clears throat> right just to be clear it's olivetti right i think that's the oh well, yeah olivetti yeah a typical italian word that is really tough to pronounce between europeans and <laughs> people in the us <laughs> Yeah, I had a, for some reason, I dropped the I at the end, so, in my head. So. Yeah. All right, moving to the next question. If people do get interested in picking up Emacs because of what they see you do, how do you recommend they say they get into it? Oh, yeah. Um, so, I've been, 
I think a lot of it comes down to what are the problems that they're trying to solve. And so I walk them through my journey. Um, I, wor I worked in TextMate for a long time, then Sublime, then Atom. And then in 2020, I hopped over to Emacs, started writing in it, and I chose Space Max, and then I chose Doom. And then I was like, wait, start over, erase everything, and just do the tutorial. So I did the tutorial, and then I started writing, and I was like, oh, I really want this functionality. And so I went and I looked for it, and I installed the package. And then I got the functionality, went back to writing, and I'm like, oh, my editor should really be able to do this. And I thought about it. So a lot of it came down to the experience of what they're trying to accomplish um, and, and really helping ask them that. I had a one mentee had used Vim for a long time and then was exploring using Evil Mode and Emacs. And we, we had conversations and it was like, go back to Vim. Like you were using VS Code, just go back to Vim. And they went back to Vim and then they started writing, well, they went to NeoVim and they started writing, writing Lua plugins for stuff. And it just helped free them and they gained that ownership in their text editor. So, I try to have them think through what are the common tasks that they're trying to accomplish. And then thinking in terms of that. So instead of going and finding a solution, understand the problems they're experiencing, which tends to be what we should do in software development. <laughs> instead of yeah. implementing an idea, solve a problem. Sometimes I mean, it's fun to implement an idea. Yeah, I, I think it's really the crux, really, when it comes to software development, because what is at the crux of any kind of engineering? Well, it's the problem you're trying to, to solve. If you've got two islands and you need to join them up together, well, I need to be, build a bridge. Now, obviously, with software, we have problems that defy the law of physics, which is great because we get very complex problems that are very exciting to solve. But when it comes to onboarding people into those ways of solving problems, well, I think mentoring, the, the key behind mentoring is that Together, we're going to look at a problem and we're going to try to see how I would fix it. And you're going to try to appreciate whether this is something you would do as well or would like to, to do. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, it, it ta it's, it's really taking time to walk with them on the journey to understand what's frustrating them. I have a coworker, we've been working together for a very long time. She is not a fast navigator of her editor, but as we've talked, that's not where she's looking to get better. She's looking to get better at um, asking the questions of the clients early so that we don't go down long paths of implementation. So it's it's been great because she's not looking to get better at her text editor. She's adequate um, for how she navigates. Other people look and they're like, man, I want to do it faster. I want to do it different. I want to do it better. And then we have a different conversation. Right. All right, moving on to the next question. I've been using Emacs for about 30 years, and I find it really difficult to figure out how to help people get started with it. Um, so I guess my question is the same as the green question right above it. I think it's slightly different, though, it, because it is. we're thinking more about, well, go on, go on, please interpret. Yeah. How I so um, my wife, a while ago, talked about the idea of relative to anybody, I am an expert or slightly more informed on a topic than the person, quote, behind me. And there's a person ahead of me who's slightly more informed than I am. And so what we're looking at is perhaps with 30 years of experience, introducing someone to Emacs might be difficult because you've, you're have you too much of an expert. Um, so maybe the there's a, an idea of like, what are the principles of pedagogy? I know we that was talked about yesterday in a presentation about like, here's a constraint, you're using Emacs for the course. But so it's that idea of sharing what you have, where you're at, will, I think by nature, move the entire 
queue of people, like they don't really exist. I mean, they do, but they don't. Behind you, it'll help move them together forward just a little bit. And maybe we all move the condition together. So it's not a, a only one person kind of thing. It's a, it's a, a, a mindset of improving shared understanding. Exactly. And this, I'd like to come back on something that you mentioned in your answer, because it's, you know, when the person asking the question mentioned 30 years of advance, basically, on studying Emacs, you know, that's a lot of time. And you tend to equate this to a massive gap in terms of skills between the two people. And whilst it's uh, obvious that would be a gap of skills, you know, I, I find that learning in terms of pedagogy works best when the person doing the teaching is very close in terms of skill levels to the person being taught. Why is it the case? It's because it's much fresher in their memory what are the different um, ailments that they have to go through to acquire a particular skill. Um, to, to go a little bit into the theory, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Vygotsky or at least the I plus one. Are you familiar with this, Jeremy? I am not. Go forward. Go it's, on. Uh, so I used to be a teacher before, and it's one of the things they taught us. It's about the fact that when you are trying to make someone acquire a skill, uh, I represents their current knowledge, and plus one is the thing that you should be teaching them. And the theory behind it is that it's much easier to teach someone to teach something to someone when they only have to focus on plus one, i.e. something that is very close, nearby to them. If you go with something that is i plus two, i plus three, or God forbid, i plus 10, it's going to be much harder for them to get to the understanding because the distance is much greater. And that, that's why I think mentoring is can be taken in two ways. It can be a mentor who is merely ahead of you by plus one, or it could be a mentor that is ahead of you by plus 10, but who has the understanding of what plus one, plus two, and plus three is. Yeah, and it it is very, it can be very challenging to unwind that. I know, like, if we think about all of our hands um, or input me methods have a memory of something that I honestly couldn't tell you what it is, right? <laughs> like I, I know how to do it on a keyboard, right? We've we've internalized so much, and so yeah, how to walk backward is a, is a distinct challenge, and being curious with them and close to them, and not asking, trying to diffuse questions and not ask like leading, not overly leading. Uh, an example. Early on in my like mentoring career, I was working in a community project and I really wanted to go in and say to everybody, why do we suck at sharing code? <laughs> but instead I said, wait a minute, what would be the question I could ask the group in which I could then ask my question? So I, instead I went into the group and I said, how are we doing about sharing code? And collectively, we were able to establish, we didn't feel very good about it. And that conversation now, nine years ago, helped move a process along for the last, like it gave it energy for nine years of how we're sharing and how we're approaching stuff. So yeah, the curious questions um, are super helpful. All right, lovely way to, to finish this point. Uh, we have about 10 more minutes, so I'm glad that we have a little bit of extra time to answer the questions because we have a little more. Um, all right, I'm going to switch to the next question. We can come back to people reacting to what you just said a little bit later. Sure. All right, have you encountered anyone that are being neg negative about the fact that you're using Emacs, assuming that they just don't know or have misconceptions about Emacs and nothing malicious? If so, how do you handle these kinds of people? Sure. Um, so at work, uh, I get a, a gentle like elbowing of like, oh, Jeremy's going to talk about Emacs again. Um, so it's not entirely, maybe it's a little dismissive, but but I don't actually care because like, it's like being, I don't know, it's like being made fun of for using 
a particular type of pen. My goal is to write something, right? And I'm using a pen that gives me joy. Um, when I talk with my mentees, like I want to meet them exactly where they're at with their code and like they're, what they're comfortable with and help them remove any of that potential like inadequacy, sense of inadequacy or imposter syndrome or any of those things because the goal is to, for me, to be better at computering. Like hop on my computer, I want to be able to use it at a speed of thought that doesn't introduce a lot of friction. Uh, another speaker talked about that um, using Hyperbole and a couple of plugins to write stream of consciousness. And that was an important consideration. I want my text editor to flow with me. And so I'm like, well, Emacs flows with me smooth. Like you can deride it all you want. It doesn't thread very well, but it's just me on this machine. I don't need it to overly thread at least for my use cases. Yeah, uh, I can only agree. I 100% with what, you, what you've just said. And it's it's very easy to dismiss stuff like Vim or Emacs based on the very trite sentences that everyone use. But at the end of the day, I really like what you said. It's those are just pencil that we're using to express ourselves. And we're doing something a little more fancy than just you know writing words on a page, but mm -hmm. ultimately, it's just text at the very bottom. So whatever helps us write this test, this text more easily, you know, it's always good. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving on to the next question. I love the attitudes and worldview that infuse infuse your blog post and your talk this weekend. Uh, learn something every week. It's cumulative. English class was the most important. What other advice do you have, and how is it generalizable to those of us who are not devs? Sure. Um, so I think one of the really big changes for me, and I talked about this in the writing uh, Q&A, is switching my blog from a topical one about role-playing games and board games into anything that I think I want to write. And that shift happened about the time that I was really exploring using Emacs for writing. And so previously I had, I would write blog posts in Markdown using, or I would write it in the web interface. And getting to the point where my writing was the same as my coding was the same as my RSS consumption, was the same of, of a lot of these things, freed up my general interests so that they all can kind of play in that space. So, and, and that's the, I think Feynman said, like his notes are his thoughts. It's not him thinking. I mean, they are him thinking as well. So it's really framing it that way. Uh, and then for not devs, my, my daughter is uh, has been doing screenwriting and she just had her uh, school license for the tool that they use for writing screenplays. She had to pay for it her own, on her own. And I was like, hey, let's take a look at Emacs. There's a package for this. Um, maybe it makes sense to you. So I think the... Um, really to summarize it is like the broad curiosity in in like I have a liberal arts degree I have barely any, any um, computer science uh, classwork practice I have a lot of practical experience doing software development but theory is minimal instead I look to things like Lord of the Rings or role-playing games or poetry or history or whatever, and be curious. <clears throat> and then be playful. Uh, the introduction of Git locally, where I can just have a Git repo, means my text is recoverable. I don't, I can play. I'll break it, I'll change it. It's software, let it be soft. 
it's not hard. Um, it can be hard to work with it, but let it be soft. Let it be pruned. Let it go away. Let it die. Let it come back. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a lovely attitude to have. I mean, yeah. I, I've already talked about my uh, past as an English major in uh, one of the Emacs Conf talk, but just like you, you know, I don't have a Comsci education. I just started with needing a better pen, and that was about 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. Now I find myself, you know, hosting Emacs Cons, but you know, it was a very incremental process, a very cumulative process to reuse the word that we used before. Yeah. And what I also like about people outside of Comsci using Emacs, and we've got plenty of such examples in the conference in the presentations we've had this year, but also last year, it's that you get so many different windows into how people are using Emacs. And it kind of harks back to what I was saying before about Emacs being a platform with many horizontal packages permitting any kind of workflow imaginable. And some people are going to gravitate towards org mode. Your, I think it was your sister that you mentioned that was uh, looking into packages for writing screenplays. Well, We've got such a thing in Emacs. I mean, a screenplay yeah. is just a monospace font with some fancy formatting. It's not very complicated. Yeah. And if you can get behind you know, someone using such a stable format for writing screenplay with many rules, but ultimately all the screenplay look the same, well, Emacs is kind of just the same. It's about standardizing the way you edit text. So I think your sister was already half won on the idea. Yeah. Oh, it was my it was my my daughter. I'm trying to sell her on. Oh, it. daughter. Sorry. Yeah. She also picked up programming just one day and was like, I forget the, like she was playing with a stage manager programming thing or like have a little avatars moving around, and so she's got a predispos predisposition to, like, the craft of things, um, and I think that's another aspect is like, I'm not. I mean, I'm, I appreciate science. I'm here for a scientific approach, but I also really enjoy the craft of things, um, playing with it. Like, this is my playground. I love kind of hacking on it and looking at packages and seeing how I might use it, pick it up for a little bit, and then maybe I forget about it. Right. Well, Jeremy, yeah. I think that was a lovely. Yeah. Finished. Oh, sorry, plasma. Oh, sorry. I thought it was someone on Mumble talking to me. Uh, I'm <laughs> actually gonna be. I'm gonna have to be sorry because we only have about fifty seconds until we move oh. on to the next talk. But please, uh, plasma strike. If you want to ask your question to Jeremy, by um, all means, stay in the room. Yep, I'll be here. And we'll be recording all of this, and we'll put this later on the talk page. So, uh, Jeremy, I'll have to say bye now because I need bye. to prepare the next room. But it was lovely talking with you, and thank you for all your answers. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. See you. Hello. One, one of the things with Emacs is it's not, it's, it's like when you change the file management, you just change very, very small amounts of what exactly you need, you want to change. Yep. Like you go from text editing to your, uh, from your, to your file manager, you're not changing your theme. You're not right. changing your font. Mm -hmm. And you use your bookmarks, you use your bookmarks in your emails, you use your bookmarks in your org mode documents, yep. you, use your e you use it in EWW buffers if you use that, but it's just the, yeah, it's just the least amount of incremental changes. Yeah, you're, when you were talking about like the, the reducing friction, like turn off editing, or not editing, but autocorrect um, while you're typing is absolutely spot on. You're 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 wanting to get whatever is flowing needs to keep flowing. Like as a programmer or as a creative, anytime I can hit flow is my goal. And so paying attention to what removes flow is or hinders it or saps energy and that unified environment of emacs is really helpful to maintain that so yeah 
You think like, it's about speed, and then once after you get some of that, then you're like, well, right. yeah, it's important, but this is like the last thing I care about. Right. Speed is all, like, yeah, there's a, a quote that I love um, called, there is, it, I forget the author, it's, there is a connection between uh, slowness and remembering and fastness and forgetting. And the slowness is an interesting, like it's, I am moving fast in Emacs because I've forgotten how I'm doing it. I just do it now, right? And then the slowness of like, being in my thought and staying on that stream is where I want to be and ride whatever that that pathway is. Um, and it's and a text editor is still hard to do that because if I were using a pen and paper, it's more cumbersome to auto edit. <laughs> but I can't get it out without like losing my thinking. And so I end up having to type it. Something I've been experimenting with is using, well, recording. Um, some other people are using, are using dictation for this to just get the blur out of the ideas. Right. And you can go back and, and glean some of that stuff out of it. Yeah. I, what I will do when I'm capturing like quotes or epigraphs is I will almost always turn on dictation because I got a book in one hand. <laughs> so I'm like, on goes the typing. Um, and yeah, that, that is, there's a, I'm really thankful that that exists, um, as well. Like my mother is blind. And so having that helps her and me communicate through text because we're both able to appreciate it, um, and use it in a way that is accessible for both of us. There was, for specifically uh... that, oh, go ahead. There's the LF2 package, which will, which will allow you to subscribe to a YouTube channel, and then download the subtitles, and give mm -hmm. you a remote control access to the MPV player to watch the YouTube thing. And right. considering you have a really big uh, subtitle thing that you can click at the various different places, it's really surprising about how different that makes YouTube feel. Yeah, I've. And then on top of that, about how much, like, if you've used it, why would you never have thought about that before? Because it's right. so much better. Right, absolutely. Sasha? Oh, I, I would say I, I do use the captions a lot also when I'm skimming through stuff for Emacs News. But um, for books specifically, I often use, um, I often use Google Lens, Lens to just capture the text and copy it. Yeah. Just so that I can have to deal with uh, the recognition errors or whatever. It's yeah. Just really, uh, useful. <laughs> I started, uh, so one of my hobbies is um, role playing games. And the tabular data that is in the role playing books is never in correct, like, copy it out. And so I, I was like, this is really annoying. And I ended up taking screenshots on my machine, running Tesseract to pipe it in and then using Emacs to like edit it because Tesseract adheres to the column format that I'm looking for. And, and I'm really thankful that we're at a place where the OCR is in a, is in good shape. Um, that's all part of my day job is working on some old documents that OCR is good, but not great because of, a, like their 19th century documents. But having that ability to me is, is really, it's really powerful because we're gonna be able to share that text. And also then once it's understood in what it's ASCII or UTF-8 encoding is, it can be translated as well. So we can make it gen like even more generally available which I think is is a, a nice thing to have. I wanted to go back to uh, the topic of mentoring since yeah. that's something that I'm very much interested in 
figuring yeah. out how to facilitate in the Emacs community. Uh, other people have, have been working on kind of remote uh, mentoring initiatives with Emacs Buddy, uh, and and uh, there are meetups as well that kind of get that sense of like, you know, what people are doing things, and then somebody can look over their shoulder and say, hey, have you ever thought about this? Right. And, well, if there are any things that you can can suggest specifically in the context of this kind of mentoring over a distance, uh, any chance yeah. you've thought about it? Um, I, I'm on the Emacs Buddy uh, repo, and I've had a handful of people reach out to me. Um, most often, we start with email. And every so often, it'll be like, hey, let's hop on some kind of video or audio. Um, even just on phone calls. Uh, yeah, I haven't used, I haven't done any of the like shared buffer stuff. Um, I know like at work we have Replit uh, where we can use that. Uh, seeing the presentation on CDRT, I was like, oh, that's really great. But what I found is being being able to see someone. Uh, not there i don't get to see them typing but i get, get to see the results of what they're doing on the computer um you know paying attention to that is the big one to help them uh think of a different way depending on where they're at when they're writing if they are like at a a pause point if i'm at my best i'll be like so what are you thinking where are you stuck because maybe they're trying to navigate somewhere and that starts to create a point for a conversation of like how do i go from here to there and um so it's it's looking for those those moments is where i i try to operate and sometimes you know so there's there's kind of like how do you go from here to there and sometimes even the what what there should I be going for is right. a main challenge, right? Because uh, especially with Emacs newbies, they might not necessarily know what's possible or what's nearby in terms of what their current knowledge is. And that's an interesting thing to map out. Is that something that you've you've thought about and you know, as you're conversing yeah. with all these people? The the main the main thing there the main function that I do talk, I talked about this, I think in the, in the, I did in the talk where it's, I need to jump between the, the test and the implementation. And since 2005, I've had that. And I watch folks not have that. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, like there's a convention in the language we work in. Let's get that installed. Let's get it going. Like that's one thing. That's one axis I know they're going to go to. Another one is the jump to definition. And I've never gotten like C tags. I haven't really spent time on that. But with the advent of LSP, it works a lot better. And so I try to get people to use that. And what I've noticed weirdly is like VS Code it doesn't work as well as I would have thought. And there's lots of like errors and warnings popping up in the bottom corner. So I'm like, well, you gotta pay attention to that. Um, but, but I try not to, I try not to get into anybody's business <laughs> about like, I'm like, let's, maybe we could fix that. Maybe we could clean it up, but it's, it's your, you know, it's, it's your, uh, it's your car you're driving. I'm, I'm just along for a ride. It's safe. We're fine. Um, so yeah, that jump to definition, <clears throat> and then the, I mean, search in project, like everybody understanding that. But I feel that the, like I mentioned in the talk, the advent of orderless is just huge. I did not realize how much I loved it because I don't have to think about things and can have slightly uh, more forgiving default searches. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard. Like, the principles of organizing 10 things versus a hundred versus a thousand versus 10,000 are just, they, they, they're not the same. A common so hang up for, uh, want to, that would easily make you skip off of 
Emacs, Org Mode, Hyper Bowl, mm -hmm. is if you go into those, in into any of those, with the mindset of I'm going to master it all before I use it, that's not going to work. <laughs> Absolutely. I was terrified of Org Mode when I started because I'm like, I I don't need to organize my life. I need to like type, and then that. Yeah, it's that incremental. What did I find yeah. that was helpful? It's or huge. the or the Linux uh, CLI toolbox, but you have to look at yeah. them as more of just I have a whole bunch of tools available to me, and I'll just pick them up as I have a problem, and as I and as the tool can be useful for this problem, and incrementally. Yeah. But, yeah, it's go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, no. oh, it's, it's actually so uh in fact when when i'm mentoring people i i have to take a step back and say okay what are we what, the note taking thing that you mentioned in your talk how do you like to take notes how do you like to keep track of the things that you want to work on when you have an idea where does it go because if you in, improve that practice and especially if you can sneak some literate programming in without them really noticing then mm -hmm. it becomes the thing that they can use to learn more efficiently yeah I, I was presenting at, I wasn't presenting at this work seminar, but I attended it and it was a crash course in command line tools. And I didn't, I mean, I, I went there to listen and there was a point where the people were like, I use this command line tool. I'm not a programmer, I'm a librarian, I'm an archivist. I use it, I'm like, great, I'm gonna remember this. And then I forget about it and I might use it six months from now. And so I tried to encourage everybody, like, come up with, like, you have a degree in knowledge and information management and organization, introspect, right? Spend some time on it. Think about what is a way that I can do this and ask questions to get to the point where you can create a discoverable inventory of the tools you've used and what that means and you know, my answer was well, i use literate programming <laughs> or i shove it in a in my bin directory in GitHub, and like i don't know if i'll remember it but i can go there every now and then and be like oh yeah that command right so note taking is the most critical component of any novel work sometimes i i wonder like if we can maybe externalize some of all this like mentoring insight and kind of like this choose your own adventure thing where the person says okay this is what i got at the moment and, and mm -hmm. then through a series of diagnostic questions we can figure out what hurts right where where is the thing that they would like to learn more about and then okay if that hurts try this and right. to keep that manageable and if there's only a way to to also be able to capture each person's state the things that they know about and have absorbed into their habits so right. you can say all right you know my recommendation for someone who's brand new to org is not the same as somebody who's like okay they've got their agendas and everything set up already just how do we represent right. that as like lists <laughs> right i i've i've given up on trying to to map that i like the the one-on-one -on -one conversations and and discovery um and i think that's th that's the part where you're looking at you're you're asking about how do we make the process and like i heard like how do we help equip those who want to mentor as well right making that reducing the barrier in a way i, don't know. I think i think what you said about enjoying the conversation and the fact that it is really unique for each person in each situation uh, that comes up i i suspect what it just comes down to is more like capturing the good stuff of each mentoring session or whatever maybe it's getting the mentees to write very short blog posts about what they learned this week or whatever else right. and then you say oh yeah you know we saw we we ran into the same problem three months ago let me go look it up and then that becomes a reusable segment yeah i want when i worked at a coding boot camp the they tried to encourage uh, the mentors to say like write blog posts for the mentees and um, 
That was, some of them did, but it was intimidating because like, they didn't want to, I don't know. I, are we enculturated in our, in an education system where we can't get it wrong or we need to look like we're more of an expert than we are? Um, I, I don't know. I have a lot of like, I'm a middle-aged white guy. I've got a lot of background and privilege in my, my like career. So like, I, it's not as scary to put something forward for myself as it might be as like a, a woman in tech or a minority in tech. Um, cause that's a, that's a different place. And I want to really get done with that. <laughs> I don't like that at all. And I would love our, like, just, just write. And it doesn't have to be public, right? You don't have to make it public, but if you make it discoverable to yourself, it, that's the big thing. And, you know, one of my, one of my coworkers, um, she doesn't blog, but she definitely has a large knowledge base of stuff that she references because she's pulling out all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, whatever you're doing is working. That's great. <laughs> so. so I was trying you to have some. There's a good opportunity with the Emacs conference to accomplish this. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you make, like, a – because – one of the things with it is you do a, uh, Sasha, you do a really good job of using all the, you're the one who has like the Emacs buffer with the time on it, right? Is that your screen that's being recorded for that? Because you have a um, really good example of a really consolidated Emacs workflow that works really good with the Emacs conference. So if you had like a page that described how you did all that stuff, in the Emacs conference, like on that, and then we then you did even more stuff with that. Like you do the uh, org mode file that you can just put straight into your agenda for your time zone. That's I use that. That was really nice, just to because it allowed me to reorganize and see how all the talks would work together and which ones I wanted to do. You could add org mode to do tags with that to uh, say. Uh, plan to watch. I want to rewatch, but I have to skip it because there's another talk I'm watching, you know, like a couple tags don't care about so that people can easily tag all the talks that they care about on top of that. And then with, uh, I'll pro I'm going to try to email these ideas on it, on it too, but then you can also you have the etherpad questions. You could put all those in org mode documents with crdt.el, host all those in the Emacs conference, and then people could use that to edit all the documents at the same time. So then everybody's actually collaboratively editing. And then people have all the scaffolding for uh, if you do the Emacs meetings, buddy meetings, because they know exactly how to to set it all up with that. And then you combine it with any number of uh, whatever chat uh, video program so that people can talk and watch each other. I have in fact, uh, a, I have a presentation later on Emacs Conf infrastructure and I will capture the note and maybe I can include a mini tutorial in the schedule org so that people can be like, hey, by the way, you could refile these things into your own org files or uh, tag them. And here's a list thingy that filters your agenda by the, your tag or whatever. It'll be fun. But it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like uh, it is. You're right. It is an opportunity to expose people to more things that they could do in kind of a scaffolded way. Uh, that's interesting stuff. But I, uh, your point actually, Jeremy, also going back to previous part of the conversation mm -hmm. about it is difficult for people to share. When you realize, you know, like I keep telling everyone, hey, if you blog about Emacs, you'll not only learn things for yourself and make things more searchable, other people will come by and tell you even better ways of doing things, which yeah. is something that always happens to me too when I'm posting. Does that ever happen? <laughs> I'm sure that happens to you. That's great. I, I, I love getting those things like, uh, yeah, Howard's yes. presentation on the game stuff. I'm like, I'm going to go explore that now because 
that. That's the wheelhouse. So. Just have to make it less intimidating, right? And and kind of yeah. change people's perception that oh, blogging or sharing tutorials or whatever that's done when you're 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 an expert when you're an experienced, to rather working out loud, thinking out loud. This is just that I'm learning along the way, and it right. might not be the most efficient way to do things, but this is what, what I've learned right now. Yeah, so. and I had a handful of times where I posted something and someone was like, Oh yeah, this is, this would, have you tried this? Or and I'm like, I didn't even know that existed. That makes this easier. Thank you. <laughs> right. Never have had, like, I've written this like little hack to, and I'm very proud of it because it's clever. And then someone's like, Oh yeah, there's a package for that. It's called this. Like, <laughs> right. Great. Yeah. It, it's just, it's yeah. It, the fantastic part, it, I played Legos as a kid and me and my friends would play Legos at the house and Emacs has this like feeling of playing Legos with a group of people across the world. In fact, one of my current, uh, well, one of my best friends now, we met a year ago and it turns out we both love Emacs. We talk every Thursday and we hang out and we talk poetry we talk Tom Petty, we talk Emacs, we talk software development. He does Python, I do Ruby, um, just anything and everything. And it's, it's also, we both are curious because we don't use it the same way. And we, like how we accomplish a task. And I think that's the fascinating part to me is we each get to explore our way to interact with the computer uniquely by whatever pathways are in our brain we see stuff we pick it up and we're like that doesn't quite work for me or oh that worked really well <laughs> fascinating like uh, i don't know shared art installation <laughs> I think you're you're onto something that I've, I also resonate with. One of the things that fascinates me about Emacs is all these people's configuration files. So they're you know crystallized workflows, and it's really when you when you talk to them and you see how they're using it, and you understand a little bit of kind of their story and mm -hmm. things that they need, the ideas they've had. Uh, that that that's really fascinating. And I think that's one of the things that makes it possible to be perpetually curious about Emacs because right. it's not just the, you know, this is the, these are all the Lego pieces there are, but you have this community of people who are using these Lego bricks in such fascinating ways. And they're always inventing right. new things for it. Yeah. New colors, new shapes, they show up. It's, it's, it's great. Um, it's like powered twice or something like that. Cause it's like, you can use Emacs with a thousand different customizations mm -hmm. and then you can interact with people who can each also use Emacs in a thousand different ways. Right. And then you can both learn from each other and that can go a thousand different ways. So it's like, it's like powering your yep. something along I, those lines with each other and like how different and how much you can learn from it. Yeah. It, the kind of touching back to the the mentee that I have who went he had originally started in Vim and then did VS Code and then we were talking and he was going to go into Emacs and I didn't have a I mean sure that'd be great but he's like I don't have a lot of time and I'm like well go back to the place that you have that experience and he did and then he started writing Lua plugins he was like this is so much fun I'm like good, you're on the right path. <laughs> like, maybe there'll be space, like, over time, how Lua plugins and Emacs, you know, who knows? I know that Lua, you can use Fennel to write Lisp. Um, in You write Lisp, and it will transpile Fennel to Lua. I forget how that plays out. But we're not too far away from those two things being able to, to to play but the, i guess you know the question is does it does it, does it need to i don't know yeah i mean even without direct code translation the cross-pollination of ideas is certainly right. enough I, I love the fact that 
people are borrowing ideas from VS Code and from Vim, and and people yeah. look at Emacs Conf videos and other things and say, hey, that's a cool thing in Emacs, but I don't want to ever use Emacs. I'm going to do that whole thing in Vim, and I think that's fantastic. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, monocultures die; they just do, and computer software and computer industry pushes towards monoculture because of um, it wants the highest efficiency. And I am like, that. I'm not, I mean, sometimes I'm here for that, but most of the time I'm like, I want the bumps and the warts. I want the, I want the, the art, the human interaction, the like, why are we trying to accomplish this? It determines, it depends on how you determine efficiency because oh. Emacs is far, even if Emacs isn't multi-thread, it's far more efficient because, okay. of the, because of the mental model shifts because you're able to play and tweak with it and then uh, have as much of a mental model shift for each task change that you want. Like, yeah, I want my fi my file manager to some to not be an editable text buffer. Although sometimes when I want to rename files, I want it to be that. Right. Yeah, and and really like to be clear, I like the idea of Emacs as a projection of like how I think about stuff. So it's that whatever my neurons have made a good pathway for I can have Emacs flow with me. The that efficiency side is I want a factory. I want to stamp out widgets. I want them to be the same. Chop, 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 chop. Um, that it, Emacs runs in its spirit along with Vim, contrary to that. <clears throat> and I like that. Emacs is a one of the things with the like the mental model of Emacs is you should look at Emacs like. This is probably something that people should think about when they are introducing Emacs to other people. Is Emacs is a treasure trove of conflicting ways of solving the same problem, so you get, so you can individuate yourself on how you actually want to solve that problem. Yep. Do you want Vim bindings or not? You get to choose. Or do you yep. want Meow bindings? You can choose. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I came, I'm, I consider my, I, I lament because in 2005, I almost picked up Emacs and it wasn't until 2020 that I picked it up. And fortunately I picked it up when I did because I was able to look at things I had previously accomplished and find analogs and things like Helm and Ivy we're both two different ways of doing it and uh, consult and then our Selectrum and then consult like they all had these different ways and it felt great because I could find the thing that worked for me. And they were they're close, but then they also like branch out and do things differently. And it's just it was so fascinating to explore each of those and spend an hour or two on a primary task and seeing where that little thread went. Um, it's great. So, so tell me a bit more about how you got that, how you got into Emacs. What, yeah. what was the, you know, what pulled you in? So, yeah, this is a great little moment. Um, I started in TextMate in, so, um, that's kind of the, where I would say the beginning for coding for open source and using open source software, sorry, using open source frameworks and languages. So TextMate to Sublime, uh, basically TextMate couldn't search very well at the time. Uh, it was getting bogged down. So I moved to Sublime, which solved it, felt well, carried the same like UI look with me. And then when I was at a conference, there was a talk about using an open source editor. I was like, yeah, I need to do that. I really need to. And Adam was viable. And I was like, oh, this is really close. I'll use it. And I didn't think too much about it. And then the writing was on the wall that Adam is going away. 
And I was like, I need to find an open source editor that speaks to me. And I said, all right, Vim, this is my fifth time. I will try. And I gave an earnest two weeks. And I'm just like, I cannot get this mental model in my head. So I'm like, all right, I set it down. I can use Vim. I'm comfortable. I think it's a great tool, but my mental model doesn't map well there. And I'm like, all right, here we go, VS Code. All right, you're you're fine, but um, I feel like I might accidentally charge my credit card in the text editor on the default installation. And that was alluded to by in one of the talks. Um, I forget who. Um, he, German, <laughs> talked about mandating Emacs in his computer science classes. He mentioned like the Microsoft Office or Microsoft Marketplace felt like it was there. So that was one. But the moment where I was like, oh, hell no, VS Code, was when I tried to type the commit page and the, or I wanted to com use a commit from the command palette. And it brought up an HTML text input area, and it was 30 characters. And in that moment, I saw several things. One, I'm like, no, that's terrible because I want to write something meaningful. Two, this is the behavior that this tool is modeling. That tells me that history and like how it is built is not important. And yes, I can fix it and get around it. And I kind of did. And I was like, the principles are just, they're there. And then also understanding like there's a bunch of telemetry underneath it. And that, so I used Co VS Codium, but there's still telemetry. And I was like, all right, 2005, Jeremy. Let's go try Emacs. Let's see if we can do it. And I hopped in. I grabbed Space Max. I was like, yeah, this works pretty well. Like, I don't know how to use the keys very well. I'm, well, I'm, I'm figuring it out. Um, and then I was like, you know what? Why don't I do the tutorial? And it was the tutorial that hooked me. Not because everything made 100% sense because Emacs is old. It had a lot of language that was hard to, to like internalize, but it presented it in a conversational, I'm going to meet you where you're at and we're going to walk with it together. And then when I was done with the tutorial, I said, you know, Space Max, I don't understand it. And it's got some performance. It looks like there's like, extra stuff that I may not need. So I went vanilla, nothing Emacs, and just started working. I was like, well, how do you do this? Although five minutes of Space Max or any of those Emacs distribution shows you unequivocally how different oh, it can be. It was, it, was trans, it was so amazing and it was so good, but I knew my nature was I was frustrated in like I wrote an atom package and that was awful. It was so terrible, but I knew what I wanted. And then I wrote, um, I started writing a VS code and I'm like, oh no, 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 we're not here for this. And so yeah, Space Max showed me like this can look and feel like a space that I used to be in. And then it has more functionality, more more stuff. It's going to be great. And then I just was like, I'm going to go find my own. And I'm really happy that I took the path because I just worked, wrote, and I'm like, I bet you this. I bet you the tool. I know it can do this because it, you know, TextMate did this or Adam. I'm going to go. F I went on to Melpa and I found couple different things. I'm like, all right, let's try them. I'm like, that's the one. Great. Roll it in. Keep working. I know I can do this. Find a package. And so I built up this sense of the packages. And, um, you know, my strategy was go to Melpa, look at, I, that was the one that showed up. Look at the 
number of downloads. So I'm like, what's the high stuff? What really gets used? There's something there. And then also look at what was most recently updated. So kind of pivot on those along with a keyword search. And I found the, the tools that, that worked well. Um, but it, it, it really came down to like that VS code I was almost in, but I've been around long enough to know what Microsoft will do. <laughs> For me, I was I always like customizing things. I think I saw some interesting Emacs videos. I wanted to try. Uh, wow. I wanted to try working more with the keyboard and not need, I think, the mouse on a laptop. Mm -hmm. And so I was looking explicitly for like ways to just work on the keyboard only, which meant that I wasn't looking for programs that followed Kua. Control, so if it, which really leaves you like two options, Vim and Emacs. Yeah. And when I looked at the two, I saw one of the big differentiating factors I saw was Tramp, which was, oh, you mean I get a SSH into a machine and have my customizations too? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then I started using Emacs more and more. Eventually, I combined that I think with a tiling window manager, NixOS, mm -hmm and start banishing as much of the GUI as I possibly could, running MPV over VLC so I could edit, so that my uh, config files could be keyboard-oriented. Mm -hmm. My settings config config menus are now keyboard-oriented. And yeah, that, that was the incremental process of just, yeah, making the computer nicer more efficient and then you figure out all the other advantages of the yeah how did you get into it sasha oh you're you lost it. your sound is gone ah uh, sorry uh my fist is mute button okay I i'll tell you that, that story i get thought out of my head so i forget it but what you described Jerry, what Kind of starting with the distribution uh, and then pulling back and starting with vanilla and building up kind of close to stories that I've heard from a lot of people in the community where the distribution gives them kind of an, an end goal, at least work requirements. So get the fun and they're not slugging through the weeds around the start. Um, mm -hmm. I have a hard time modifying it because modifying the distribution is itself very different from the tutorials they see. They feel like they want to understand the different parts more. And so then they pull back and they say, okay, I've got this thing that I can use. I really need to just get some quick work done. But I have this thing that I can work on that's mine. Right. And that I understand because I'm building it up from the from the ground up. Okay, so that's it's like, oh, it's like interesting thought there. A lot of people are like that. And, and it really helps them to both have that insight, which is see through distributions and also videos of other people's workflows and, and press kind of conference presentations often about completely different topics right so just someone whizzing through ruby on rails or whatever else and doing all of this in uh, but also having one help them break out okay well there's a lot of work from where i am to where that is how do i do it without being overwhelmed because right. if they start to try to learn everything they will go crazy and they'll fall and so breaking it down is super important. Uh, and how I got into this whole Emacs thing uh, was I was reading all of the computer science books in the university library, and one of the Unix power tools, that book had a chapter on Emacs and had, you know, oh, this, there's some other type of whatever. So I said, okay, that's interesting. So I, I went and tried it out. But the reason I really got into it was because I was using John Wigley's planner mode. This was before org mode came about, so planner mode. I said, hey, you know, this is great. Uh, I, I'm looking for a way to help out. If you need help verifying any bugs, you know, send them to me and I'll, I'll do the yeah. you know, figuring out. He's the he's, he's author and maintainer. And then he made me the maintainer for it. <laughs> so I was like, okay. And then that's how I got to know this wonderful community of people who guys Emacs so much. Um, and, and it just goes there because 
really when you're when you see all these different ways that people use it and all these different stories that mm -hmm. you get send off and they're using it to bake sourdough bread and you know do knitting and all the crazy yeah. things that people come up with i've been using it as an audio editor it's just weird it's just fun oh man yeah that's so, great yeah yeah cool. stuff every uh sasha like two things that i was meaning to say is every time i see the on the emacs conference the time the clock the scratch buffer with the, the big <laughs> clock that is ticking down as and the multi multiple sized fonts as i always think wow that's really cool i didn't know emacs could do that wait no i saw that last year <laughs> How do you do now? How do I do that? Because that's not, and that's not something I normally even think about Emacs doing. Right. <laughs> I don't think sure. about putting. There's an Emacs conf stream dot el in the Emacs conf el repository. Uh, I can grab the link and open, but you can grab the source code from there. It's basically you add the the text property. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a thought that though that has repeated multiple years. Like I didn't know Emacs could do that. Wait, I thought about that. I I had this exact thought last year when I saw it. Oh, it's we're like I'm at the point where it's like I have memories of remembering doing something. <laughs> I don't have memories of doing it. <laughs> like all of the things, like so. So it's again we. Emacs helps expose like the like it's anything's possible and we see how it becomes possible through other people and then it gets our brains thinking about other ways of doing stuff and I think that's the exciting part I have a dog who wants to go play frisbee and that's actually <laughs> that's actually one of the reasons why I want to encourage people to not only you know talk about Emacs and write Emacs blog posts, but also casually demonstrate Emacs in the sense of doing something else. So, mm -hmm. for example, Ruby Emacs people and Emacs on stuff. If you're presenting about Ruby on Rails and you're doing all of your fancy education and and uh, things while you're while you're presenting Rails, you reach all these people who who are interested in Rails, develop Rails, but who might right. not have even considered Emacs. Uh, and um, here, you know, it's, you, you probably would, uh, I would probably have a hard time writing an entire talk about uh, adding text properties, but the fact that there's a thing here that shows, hey, this is possible in Emacs can get people to think, okay, so how do I get from here to there? Right. Just yeah. showing the possible. Yeah. Which so, source uh, code is in the, which you call it? Yeah, I just saw that. <laughs> I think there's a weird, interesting thing how Emacs dovetails with people who are interested in making their own uh, local first Zettelkastens. Because look at how many Zettelkasten packages you have, especially with how much, like, it feels like, it seems like Emacs has more than Vim, but Vim is bigger or VS, feels like it has more than Vim or VS Code, and VS Code's bigger. I'm not sure, but it feels mm -hmm. like it. And, same thing with that hypercore, where that hypercore felt more like a local first peer to peer system. So, that, like, there's a weird dovetail where, like, they want the knowledge bases that are local first, comprehensive, mm -hmm. because uh, one of the properties of the Zettelkastens or org mode agendas is that it's all your notes in one place it's not you know your notes in uh either pad and your notes in uh your notes in google calendar your notes in uh what you in your in 20 different places your notes in mm -hmm. evernote it's right. your notes in one program in one place because you have to deal with them and they're going to be in files on your hard drive and you're going to have packages that aren't that's the other weird thing too is how many like you install an Emacs package. One of the guarantee, some of the guarantees you seem to get with it is, if it does use an external program, it's going to have a lot of configuration in Emacs. Mm -hmm. It's going to be installed. 
it's going to be local first because yeah. like you have flow bits but how many programs like are um are cloud first and it feels like most of those are like org trello where it's like i want to use org mode but other people use trello so i'm going to begrudgingly using this org trello to be a bridge between the two not because mm -hmm. i wanted to use org not because I want to use Trello in the first place, or I started off with Trello and now I want to use org mode. Right. No, you're you're that local first. The thought thought I have is with the 2022 um, interest rates going up, the era of free money, or even like getting money for more va more money than it actually costs, like. It was minting money. We are going to be seeing how these organizations that had financial runways, all of these cloud services, what's not going to last because there's no funding. Um, and like the durability of our local first, plain text, free open source stuff, like. I won't have to do a content migration unless I get a bee of my bonnet and want to like change from org mode to markdown for some reason. Like I have it and then I can send it out. So there's also like that posse principle, publish on site, syndicate everywhere um, is what Emacs and Vim, like they allow for us to do. Well, that's part of the individuation is you have yeah. multiple options of doing something so you can choose something so you can take ownership of your data in the way you want. Mm -hmm. It all dovetails into each other. And I think that's something worth thinking about, especially in relation with who should learn and how should you introduce Emacs to people? Because like with the idea, with the idea of, people should try an Emacs distribution and then start their own from scratch just so that they like, if you use it for 10 minutes, you'll gain so much because you right. use your three and then all of a sudden you realize you also know how malleable Emacs can be. And then you start saying, now, how do I do that? So I get to make those choices. Yeah. yeah I... Or you might say these, this person did it well enough. I don't have to. That reminded me of something that I also want to mention, talking about realism and, and malleability. Uh, another tip I came across, don't know from whom, I didn't even from you, I don't know, it's, uh, it's to define aliases because we use different words from what the functions are. So it's one, one of those little meta things that, you know, if you keep calling it something else, just de define it so that you can call that, that comes in your words. Yeah. Little things. Yeah, it's... It's interesting. Anyway, I gotta go disappear and get ready for my yeah. but, Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll yeah. what you said. All right. I need to take my dogs out and play frisbee. They have been so patient. So it was great talking with all of you. And Sasha, thanks for the org organizing energy you've put into this. Plasma Strike, thank you for your presentation. Like I love this conference. So thank you very much. And now. Yep. Have a good rest of your Sunday. Bye. You are currently the only person in this conference.